Good morning from New York City. For our viewers worldwide, I'm Matt Miller in for Jonathan Farrow, looking at futures that are substantially down and rates that are off to the races. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Coming up, futures fall as jobless claims hit the lowest level since January. Investors on edge as policymakers ramp up the hawkish rhetoric and time running out in Washington, D.C. with strikes and shutdowns looming over markets. Let's kick it off with the big issue, higher for longer. We're prepared to raise rates further if appropriate, and we intend to hold policy at a restrictive level until we're confident that inflation is moving down sustainably toward our objective. A soft landing is a primary objective, and I did not say otherwise. The committee decided at today's meeting to maintain the target range for the federal funds rate at five and a quarter to five and a half percent. The savings rate for consumers has come down a lot. The question is whether that's sustainable. It could also be that for other reasons, the neutral rate uh, of interest is is higher for, for, for various reasons. We've raised our policy interest rate by five and a quarter percentage points and have continued to reduce our securities holdings at a brisk pace. We've covered a lot of ground and the full effects of our tightening have yet to be felt. Joining us now to discuss is Zach Griffiths of Credit Sites and Samir Samana of Wells Fargo. So a lot to talk about, but I've got to draw attention first to the 10 year. Uh, what we're seeing right now is the highest level since 2007. Does it make sense that we get this big pop in rates? Zach, I'll start with you after the uh, jobless claims numbers came in lower than expected. That's certainly supportive of the idea that the Fed is going to have to remain higher for longer. And I'd say yesterday's hawkish pause was even more hawkish than we had expected with the 50 basis point increase in the policy rate indicated by the 2024 dot. And so I think if you're seeing the labor market starting to show signs of tightening again, and I think overall we've seen better balance in the labor market recently outside of this jobless claims print, that would be more supportive of a balanced approach. But I think the pop today is really the one-two punch of the Fed yesterday, jobless claims this morning. And, and the Bank of England, even though they kept the policy rate on hold, they did up their pace of quantitative tightening. So a lot of hawkish developments to consider. And I think that's definitely a big driver of what we're seeing in yields this morning. Right. If you look around other central banks, we see a little bit uh, less uh, or fewer hawkish moves with, um, you know, the, the central bank in Switzerland holding. We were looking for a hike there. Um, we're just getting headlines out of the ECB right now um, saying that uh, they think, at least according to Stor uh, uh, Stornaris, that the ECB has reached peak rates. The next move is likely a cut. Nonetheless, here it looks like um, we're taking out, certainly from the dot plot, planned cuts from next year. We were looking for four. Now we only see two. Samir, what do you make of the Fed's moves yesterday and the data that we got this morning? Yeah, I mean, look, none of it's terribly surprising, right? I mean, the economy's been surprisingly re resilient. You've seen commodity prices start to move back up to recent highs, which will also feed into, you know, broader inflation, right? When you think about, you know, gasoline prices and diesel prices with, you know, kind of the Russian ban this morning, you know, those should get an additional, you know, kind of bump this morning. And so that's going to flow into all those, you know, packages that we're all about to order for the holidays. And the Fed is very much on guard with respect to the longer those prices stay high, the more likely that they are to start flowing into other parts of the economy and consumers' inflation expectations. In terms of, um, you know, what we're looking for, it does seem like the Fed, um, you know, is still expecting to raise rates, or certainly 12 out of the 19 dots were for one more increase by the end of the year. Do they really go through with that, Zach, or are they just leaving their options open? Matt, I think they're kind of taking a risk management approach with the dot plot, almost the same way that they did when rates were at zero, signaling that rates would remain at zero for a while. They're kind of signaling they have the option to hike again, and they plan to leave rates very elevated for a long time. But when we think about what's realistic with a policy rate at 
one percent at the end of 2024 and all of these tailwinds we've seen for the u.s economy starting to come off whether you think about excess savings evaporating the restart of student loan payments we find it hard to believe they're actually going to be able to maintain the policy rate there unless inflation surprises considerably to the upside versus what we're expecting chairman paul yesterday alluded to the real policy rate and that has risen substantially it's higher than what the new york fed estimates neutral is and so we are questioning whether or not they can get even more restrictive in 2024 if inflation does come down the way we're anticipating. And so I think it's a risk management or almost an insurance approach, but we're skeptical they can actually keep rates that high for that long. All right. We just heard from former St. Louis Fed President Jim Bullard. He says the central bank, uh, in his view, may need to raise rates further. Listen in. The committee left the uh, the additional rate hike this year in the dot plot. Um, I think that may be a good thing to do um, as insurance to make sure that core inflation especially continues to come down at an appropriate pace so that the committee can get back to 2% inflation in a reasonable time frame. Let's get over to Bloomberg Economics and Politics editor Mike McKee. He just did that interview. And, you know, at the same time, um, essentially, as you were doing that, we got these new jobless claims numbers out much lower than expected. Um, does it look like, you know, the labor market is still strong enough to withstand further increases? Well, you know, the Fed did price a stronger labor market into its uh, forecast yesterday. So I'm not sure how much of a surprise this is to them, except that the numbers are pretty dramatic. Just uh, 201,000 jobless claims filed last week, a drop of 20,000 from the prior week. So uh, it is an amazing number, uh, the lowest since last January. Does it keep going? Well, we don't know because we don't know the impact of the auto workers' strikes. Just started last Friday. So that was too soon for people to uh, start filing. The other side of that is that this was the week for the uh, jobs survey for the month of September. And if that's the kind of strength we're going to see, it will raise questions for the Fed down the road. Now, the Philadelphia Fed index comes in much, much lower than anticipated. And their prices paid number went up, which is going to be interesting, get some uh, attention down at the Fed. But at the Fed, as uh, Jim Bullard and I were talking, about. They have now moved to a more compressed view of what's going to happen. But you can see the uh, green line over the red line. Those are the different uh, paths that we see now because the Fed has uh, decided higher for longer. Doesn't mean they're going to raise again, although they could, but it does mean that they're going to bring down rates much more slowly. Jim Bullard said they could go 18 months at these levels. So uh, we'll have to see on that. Here's the forecast that got everybody's attention. The GDP number uh, more than doubled for this year to 2.1 percent uh, for the Fed and then one and a half percent up significantly for next year. Unemployment not going to fall as far as they had previously forecast and inflation is going to come down. Those sort of things don't go together if we're going to have a really strong economy. Is it not going to produce inflation? We shall see, and we shall see uh, what the calendar is going to give us going forward. They have a next meeting on November 1st, and between then we have jobs, two inflation reports, and the uh, employment cost index, which will tell us something about <clears throat> where we're, we are with wages. The big question is the government shutdown, Matt, on October 1st. If that happens and the data providers don't provide the data, it's going to be interesting for the Fed to see what they do and, and how they measure how the economy is doing to decide whether they want that extra move or not. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a couple of really fascinating headwinds to uh, to throw into this, a wrench really to throw into this um, economic machinery that looks to be firing on all cylinders. I want to quickly um, get away from the Fed discussion and go to some breaking news that we have on Fox and News Corp. Rupert Murdoch stepping down as chairman of Fox and News Corp. Um, it, I don't even need to say uh, what an important person this is in terms of not only uh, those stocks and those businesses, but really uh, the global media um, and, and really global culture uh, that he has affected. Let's get over to Abigail Doolittle right now, who has more on this breaking story. Yeah, absolutely, Matt. We do have these headlines that Rupert Murdoch is stepping down as chairman of Fox and of News Corp after a seven-decade career uh, with these uh, two companies. 
companies, stepping in as uh, the sole chairman of Fox and News Corp is his son, Lachlan Murdoch. Uh, and we will have Rob, Rupert, uh, Rupert Murdoch uh, becoming the new role, taking on the new role of chairman um, emeritus of Fox Corp and News Corp. Uh, the stock is not really reacting at all, Matt, but this is uh, very, very big news that I'm sure that we'll be exploring as the day goes on. But Rupert Murdoch, who really built a true media empire over second, uh, seven decades that revolutionized news and entertainment and made him one of the world's most influential and perhaps controversial uh, tycoons. He's, of course, 92 years old, but he is stepping down and his son Lachlan Murdoch is taking over as sole chairman of both Fox and News Corp. Yeah, we're watching uh, succession happen in real time right now. Rupert Murdoch, of course, um, uh, born in Melbourne in 1931. He's 92 years old and it looks like at this point um, he's can continuing uh, a passing of the torch that started um, with Lachlan and James years ago. We'll continue to cover uh, this story because it's absolutely fascinating. Rupert Murdoch again stepping down as chairman of Fox and News Corp. Let's get back though to um, the rate story. I mean looking at the effect in markets of the Fed's more hawkish than expected pause yesterday and um, the economic data that we've got out this morning. It's not just showing in rates right. We see obviously a big move in King Dollar as well. Uh, Samir, what do you think about right now the Bloomberg dollar index at 12.58? I saw it earlier, closer to 12.60. Um, so the highest level that we've seen in a year. And we're seeing uh, drops in other currencies versus the dollar because other central banks aren't nearly as hawkish. Yeah, I mean, look, we are still the relative bright spot around the world. And I think the dollar probably has more upside, especially into the recession that we anticipate, you know, kind of unfolding later this year and into the early part of next year. Um, with respect to broader markets, I mean, I think risk is going to struggle here. So, you know, equities are probably, you know, capped in somewhat of a soft way by rates. And the higher they go, probably the lower the multiples, you know, in order to adjust for that. And so we, we think, you know, probably the, the next move for the S&P is probably down to our year end target range of around 4000 to 4200 and investors should position accordingly. Zach, is this, you know, I, I was asking yesterday and probably last week, are rates at these levels a screaming buy um, because they can't go any higher? And yet I continue to see them march higher and higher. Uh, what do you think about owning uh, treasuries right now for some risk free return and possible capital appreciation? Well, I'm not going to say they're not going any higher, but we do think that this is an attractive time to get long duration. We have been advocating to clients now that we've moved above 4%. It's a good time to start legging in and, and maybe extending duration relative to your benchmark. But we've also advocated a barbell approach as the curve is still very inverted. You can pick up a lot of yield at the very front end, but we like balancing the reinvestment risk of hiding out in the front end with adding duration at these levels. We do think as you look forward, if the Fed is in fact done, which is certainly up for debate, yields tend to fall pretty substantially in the three month and six month period following the last rate hike in a tightening cycle. Now, again, I'd say the message yesterday is the Fed may not be done and yields may remain much higher for longer than we had anticipated. But we still think when you look at real yields, 2% on the tenure, that's very attractive, especially for some of these liability driven investors that have a structural demand for duration and you have better funding metrics, especially for some of these pension funds. We think that that's going to cause continued de-risking of the portfolio and yields at these levels look good to us. Samir, what do you think about, uh, you know, buying rates right now, even corporates and selling stocks? Yeah, no, we would agree. Well, that's exactly where I was going to go with it is, you know, on a relative value basis, you've got an equity risk premium of pretty close to zero, right? You're within a kind of a rounding error. And so, you know, for equity investors, I mean, they should be thinking about whether they should be taking as much risk as they have in the past. You know, there's been plenty of surveys about, you know, kind of, you know, older investors maybe kind of having been, you know, kind of on, on kind of cruise control and maybe having a little bit too much equity in their portfolio because rates were so low. Now with cash yielding, you know, upwards of 5% and the long end, up, you know, yielding upwards of four, you know, they should really rethink that, you know, some of those allocations and, and you know, there might be more, you know, attractiveness for them on the fixed income side. One other point I'll make is on the muni side, um, especially for taxable, you know, high, high income, you know, tax bracket, you know, folks, um, the taxable equivalent yields are pretty, pretty attractive there. So we would 
also throw um, that out there as a pretty good place to, to find some income. Joe Mysack and Paul Sweeney will be happy to hear that. Samir Samana from Wells Fargo, Zach Griffiths from Credit Site sticking with us right now. I want to get a look at what's going on in stocks, down obviously in terms of futures ahead of the opening bell. Let's bring in Abigail Doolittle. Abby? Well, uh, Matt, we are in fact seeing some pretty harsh downside action for stocks. In terms of some of the individual movers, let's start out with the shares of Broadcom because they are dropping precipitously uh, down about 6%. And this after a report from the information that Google executives have extensively discussed dropping uh, the semi-chip maker as uh, an AI chip supplier as early as 2027. Investors clearly not liking that news. Cisco down 4% on the news that they are paying $28 billion to buy Splunk and a software push. They, of course, are getting away from their more traditional networking. And then to the upside, FedEx up almost 5% uh, after the delivery company raised the lower end of their fiscal 2024 adjusted earnings forecast. Investors liking that. And apparently, ground delivery, it's doing really pretty well. We'll have more on that after the bell, Matt. All right, Abigail Doolittle looking at stock market for us. Coming up, markets facing mounting headwinds from Capitol Hill. If the union gets anywhere near the wage increases they're asking for, it just makes the Fed's job even tougher to constrain inflation. In terms of the government shutdown, you know, clearly that's a net negative for risk assets and, and growth in the short term. A lot going on today. The open in 14 minutes. This is Bloomberg. If you look at the UAW in particular, I mean, it's part of a broader trend, right, where, where labor has far more power than at any time. On the one hand, obviously, the strike puts a little bit of downward pressure on GDP growth. But on the other hand, if the union gets anywhere near the wage increases they're asking for, it just makes the Fed's job even tougher to constrain inflation. In terms of the government shutdown, you know, clearly that's a net negative for risk assets and, and growth in the short term. Time is running out on Capitol Hill, an auto strike and a looming government shutdown threatening the Fed's dream of a soft landing. With key deadlines drawing near, the UAW, for example, unimpressed by the latest offer from Stellantis, signaling workers will reject it with just one day left before the deadline to expand their strike. A negotiator saying, quote, it didn't look good for us. The holdup is product. They didn't want to line up products for our plants for the future. This, as the risk of a U.S. government shutdown remains high just 10 days before a funding lapse, Speaker McCarthy revising his plan and winning the support of some GO holdouts telling reporters, quote, we're very close there. I feel like it's just got a little more movement to go. Let's get to our team coverage. Bloomberg's Emery Hordern here in New York for UNGA and David Welch, our bureau chief out in Detroit. Emery, um, let's kick it off with you. How likely is it that we have a government shutdown? Well, we're heading towards that at the moment, although Speaker McCarthy did have a meeting last night, lasted about two hours with the entire conference. And I think there's a few things you need to watch out for. This morning, we're going to see uh, a vote on the, or the rule of the defense budget. Remember, they voted it down whether or not to even debate it. Now we're going to see whether or not the conference is united and if they will even debate the defense bill. If that goes to the floor, that does sh show a little bit of movement within the Republican caucus of the House. What McCarthy is trying to do, though, with this continuing resolution that has a lot of provisions that the hard right flank of his party wants to see, is he really wants to make sure he's exploring all these options to keep his conference together, to have some leverage in the Senate. We saw the same strategy with the debt ceiling negotiation. Of course, the issue is that is likely going to be dead on the arrival on the Senate. So if it does come back to the House for a vote, it's going to be more of a moderate, toned down, continuing resolution to keep the government open. They have nine days to do this. And then the issue, of course, that McCarthy personally faces is the hard right flank may say, we want a motion to vacate and we don't want you to be our leader because you are not delivering on your promises. All right, Anne-Marie covering the shutdown for us, David Welch on the strike. And I think um, this took a fascinating turn because uh, we're all used to talking about, you know, wages, possibly a pension, maybe a four day work week. But the union is saying to Stellantis, you need to line up some more products. What are you going to make after the Challenger and Charger in Brampton? Yeah, look, they, they want job security uh, guarantees at this point, and, and, and we really, they've always wanted that, but we haven't heard that quite as much as we've been talking about pay and talking about pensions and economic, uh, let's say broader economic issues. Uh, so I, I thought that was interesting as well. It, it, you know, 
and, and this is just reading tea leaves here, maybe they are getting to a point where they, the, the union realizes that, hey, this is a pretty good pay raise that they're getting. Uh, and, and when I asked negotiators who were on the picket line outside of Stellantis North American headquarters in Auburn Hills, suburb of Detroit, I said, what's the hold up here? And that's, that's what they talked about most. That doesn't mean that they, they have totally agreed on pay or some of these other economic issues, but that was the big thing they said was the sticking point, is guaranteeing new vehicles in certain plants. I think Belvedere, Illinois is a very big one, but I, I think they want to see some product guaranteed throughout the life of the agreement, and, and if they could, beyond. Um, and you know, that, that tells you that maybe some of the pay stuff we've been talking about for the past few weeks uh, could be getting pretty close. Maybe they can get guarantees for Dodge and Chrysler because those brands look doomed. David, thanks very much for that. David Welch out of Detroit. Anne-Marie Hordern here in New York. Let's get back to Zach Griffiths and Samir Samana. Um, Samir, what do you think about these you know, twin threats to uh, a soft landing? How important are they? I mean, it's, it's going to make the, the Fed's job a lot harder, right? I mean, whether it's oil prices, whether it's the strike, whether it's the shutdown, which could actually cause data to go dark, right? I mean, how do you have a Fed, you know, data-dependent Fed without data? Um, so for all these different reasons, again, we think they probably raise in November. Now, if there's not enough data, it's possible they skip it, but we do think they probably raise in November. Um, we do think there's a little bit of a downward bias in risk markets. Maybe that takes some of the pressure out of the system with respect to, you know, consumers maybe not feeling as good, maybe, you know, pulling back a little bit on their consumption. But to the extent that you passed all these, you know, kind of wage hikes, whether it's pilots, whether it's, you know, you know, auto workers, the tricky part's going to be, it's going to be a while before those start to kind of roll off and become more, I guess, less, you know, attributable to, to inflation increases. And that's why we think for the most part, a lot of this caution may carry into the next, you know, first part of next year. Zach, in terms of the UAW strike, if it goes on, um, in terms of the government shutdown, if it's prolonged, I mean, isn't that inflationary and problematic for the soft landing? I think it's definitely problematic for the soft landing, Matt. And when you think about what the UAW is looking for, I think some of the demands are kind of a right sizing in terms of wages relative to what we've seen since their last deal. I think some of the progressive increases in wages that they're asking for are a little bit ambitious, let's say. And so that certainly could be inflationary depending on what gets passed. I think when you throw in the government shutdown, the potential for the strike going on longer, that's going to be more volatility in markets. And we've really seen yep. volatility come down quite a bit. And I think that complacency is what's going to get called into question over the next couple of weeks. Zach Griffiths and Samir Samana, thanks very much. Coming up, the morning calls. Then later, RBC's Lori Calvacina joins us after the opening bell on whether big tech can survive a big jump in rates. This is Bloomberg. Down to the open. I'm Matt Miller and for my good friend Jonathan Farrow. Moments away from the start of trading, we're looking at big drops on S&P, NASDAQ, and Russell 2000 futures after the Fed uh, gave us a slightly more hawkish Fed, a hawkish pause, I should say, than uh, we anticipated. There you hear the opening bell trading starts right now. Let's take a look at uh, some of the other asset classes here. Switch up the boards for me, if you would. The euro dollar right now at 106.54, and a lot of currencies falling against king dollar uh, this morning after that Fed hawkish uh, pause. The 10-year yield kind of off to the races, off of its highs for the session, but still at the highest level that we've seen since 2007 at 447.18. And NYMEX crude, which shot up at the end of last week, the beginning of this week, hasn't been doing a whole bunch since then, still hanging around $90 a barrel for West Texas Intermediate and under 95 for Brent. We do have one stock that we want to watch closely at the open. That is FedEx. Those shares uh, rising after the Courier boosted its earnings forecast. City saying the company's performance is, quote, 
quite encouraging and guidance is reasonably conservative. Abigail Doolittle joins us now with more. Abby? Well, Matt, yes, a very uh, solid quarter here from FedEx. And right now the shares are on pace in this difficult tape uh, for the best day since June of 27th, up for a third day in a row, the best day since the middle of July. So we have some strength here for FedEx. The fact that it was trading higher into the report suggests that some investors are not entirely uh, surprised by the fact that they beat. And they also raised the lower end of their guidance. It's interesting because UPS on the year down more than 10 percent or thereabouts, FedEx up more than 45 percent. So they're continuing to take ground from UPS, suggesting that UPS's weakness and issues is more UPS uh, specific. What investors are also really pleased about here with FedEx is the fact uh, that they, uh, you know, are really uh, the six billion dollars worth of cost cuts that's really dropping to the bottom line or it will in the future. Again, they raised the bottom, the at the bottom, the low end of uh, the guide. Lots of price targets raised on on the street and overall, Matt, this is just, again, a really solid beat and raised quarter. Investors rewarding the stock, the company, despite these difficult mm. trading conditions. Yeah, and also, I mean, a huge barometer for the economy as well. So always fascinating to look at FedEx and, and UPS earnings as well. Let's get uh, to that breaking news that Abigail was talking about a little bit earlier in the program. Fox and News Corp stocks fluctuating after news that Rupert Murdoch, their 92-year-old chairman, will step down and pass the baton to his son, Lachlan. Katie Greifeld joins us with more on this developing story. Katie? Well, Matt, yeah, like you said, this is breaking huge news in the media space. Rupert Murdoch stepping down as chairman from both the Fox and the News Corp boards, moving into the chairman emeritus position and making way for his son, Lachlan Murdoch, to become the sole chairman of News Corp in addition to his roles as executive chair and chief executive officer of Fox. Now, in a statement Thursday morning, Lachlan Murdoch congratulated his, his father on, quote, a remarkable 70-year career. Of course, Rupert Murdoch, age 92, he built what is now a global media empire. Over the course of those second de decades, you take a look at the shares right now fluctuating. We can go ahead and call that unchanged. And let's check in on some other media mo movers this morning, Matt, since this news lands as the writer and actor strikes grind on over in Hollywood. Warner Brothers Discovery and Paramount shares, though, slightly higher this morning. This, the Writers Guild and the Hollywood Studios said that they would meet for a second day, maybe a sign that these two sides are inching closer to a deal. All right, interesting stuff on Rupert Murdoch. We're going to continue to cover that story. Still, he is younger than the chairman and CEO of Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, let's talk about IPOs starting to lose some of their luster. Arm falling below its IPO price of $51 a share. It's fifth consecutive day of decline. Simone Foxman joins us now for more. So we're seeing, uh, Simone, you know, pops that essentially dissipate rather quickly. Yeah, I mean, we have to wonder at this moment if some of the sheen has come out of this IPO market because all of these IPOs, Arm, Instacart, slash Maple Bear, uh, Clavio, have, you know, were oversubscribed to begin with and closed substantially higher than their IPO price. But we're looking at Arm, again, a uh, priced at $51 a share, now 50 32-30-ish. Uh, Instacart priced $30 a share, now about $31. And Clavio uh, close to $32 a share after pricing at $30, $30 a share. So we're a little still above those initial IPO prices, but we de definitely saw some weakness in yesterday's trading, especially as we got that news from the Fed, that Fed decision suggesting higher for longer when the juice really came out of uh, the S&P 500. Now, part of this could be analyst-driven as well. Um, the banks that were involved in this IPO still in quiet periods and instant to cart the initial analysts coming out with some very lukewarm takes on how that company will do amid competition. Um, only one buy rating at the moment, even for Arm, it has two holds and one sell rating. But certainly there are lots of companies who have been maybe thinking about staging their initial public offerings soon that are watching how these companies are performing over not just today, but over the next couple of weeks, and looking for some indication of whether it's a good time or not to get into the market map. I believe, by the way, it's pronounced Clavio. Clavio. They do uh, software as a service for back-end application programming interfaces. Simone, thank you very much for that. Now, some big news in the networking space and software space this morning. Cisco agreed to buy cybersecurity company Splunk in a $28 billion deal. Meanwhile, Broadcom shares under pressure after a report that Google is considering dropping the chip supplier. It's going to design its own chips in-house. Ed Ludlow uh, joins us here from the West Coast for the week. 
uh, more on the tech sector. Ed? Yep, $157 per share in cash, a $28 billion deal. This is so in line with Chuck Robbins, right? A networking gear seller like Cisco adding the software services in complement to that, Splunk is a data indexing business. Basically, you can monitor network users in real time. It has a cyber security element. For those investors or Cisco and Splunk investors out there, this deal will not impact Cisco's previously announced share buyback program. Splunk CEO Gary Steele is actually going to join Cisco's executive team and report into Chuck Robbins. That's a big piece of M&A. Uh, shares reacting negatively, but I would say most sell side uh, notes that I've seen are pretty positive on this deal. Um, the information is reporting that Google will drop Broadcom as soon as 2027 for its proprietary silicon AI chips that go into data centers. Broadcom is an AI play in the sense that it offers uh, what we call ASICs, application-specific integrated circuits. So if you think about an NVIDIA H100, that is a GPU that it has multiple use cases but can handle lots of data in parallel. The TPU that Google wants to use in its data centers is, is for a very specific AI workload. And what the information is reporting is that, according to a person familiar with the matter, uh, that they did not name is that Google thinks it can save money and just design the chip in itself in-house and then go away and have it contract manufactured. Um, so this is an interesting deal. Google's been working on this TPU since 2016 with Broadcom. Now, according to this report, it seems like they want to go it alone and the shares reacting as such. By the way, is this a trend? I mean, Google thinks it can save not just money, but billions of dollars, right? right? On the other hand, they don't have the experience uh, and the years behind them that Broadcom has doing this. We've seen Apple pull back a little bit on its plans to do stuff like that in-house. Is this a trend that, the, that, that, these, so, that these tech companies are realizing they can't do exactly what the chip makers do, at least not at that pace? In very specific cases. So what Apple pulled back from was the modem that Qualcomm does, the, the specific um, uh, short distance connection. It, on the processor side, Apple is fully pushing ahead with its in-house silicon. It has the cutting edge of three nanometer smartphone processor, designs it itself, and TSMC contract manufactures it. It's a similar story with the Google TPU. There are many AI-related chips on the market, and we've talked about NVIDIA H100 being the best. But if you can control the design, find the contract manufacturing partner, then you can get yourself a higher margin processing for your data center. You can control the yep. compute and energy efficiency, and that seems to be their direction. Not just Google, Amazon is doing it as well, right, with AWS. They have two mm. generations of proprietary chip. Ed Ludlow sorting us out there, and you can catch his program every day at noon, Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde. Now, Wedbush posing the question, can tech stocks rise in a higher for longer landscape? Analyst Dan Ives, a noted bull, writes, now is not the time to become scared by the Fed. Stronger fundamentals and rate cuts on the horizon will create the start of a risk-on environment with the new tech bull market kicking off. Now, he's a bit of a cheerleader there, but let's, I mean, one that we respect and, and, and love. Uh, but let's continue the conversation with Lori Calvacina of RBC Capital Markets. Lori, obviously, Dan is very bullish. But, um, you know, higher rates, historically, not great for growth in tech companies. Is it a problem this time? So, well, thanks for having me on, as always. And look, I think the question of whether or not it's a problem is a question of your time horizon and also a question of what else is going on for tech stocks at the moment. Um, one of the things that we see when we look at the growth trade broadly right now within the big cap uh, landscape is that growth has been extremely crowded. If you look at CFTC data on NASDAQ futures positioning, and if you look at growth relative to value valuations on a weighted multiple, so taking into account, you know, kind of giving extra heft to those bigger mega caps, uh, we've basically been around recent peaks in terms of that relative valuation. And it's starting to come down. We're also starting to see the positioning correct, but we've still got a long way to go. Um, I actually like tech longer term. I'm keeping my overweight on. We've we do those calls on a long-term kind of 12-month view, but we're acknowledging that there are real some tactical problems here. And so you take that crowded overvaluation situation with the growth trade and you slap on all this talk of higher for longer, it gives you a catalyst to rotate out of something that probably needed to take a breather anyway. So, but you think uh, longer term tech can survive higher for longer. What if we don't get the soft landing? What if we get a recession that results in deep cuts? Is that bad for tech uh, because the, the economy slows down um, or is that good because rates come back down? 
I think it's actually more good than bad longer term. Again, you have to get through this initial problem with the with the the tactical concerns. But what we've typically seen is that when GDP is running in real terms below two percent, that is typically when the growth trade is outperforming the value trade. Growth ha stocks have essentially taken on a quasi defensive role in portfolios these days. Um, and if you think about sort of the market cap of the traditional defensives, they're just not as dominant as they've been in the past. And so what we do see is that when you're in these subpar economic growth periods that people rotate out of the more value cyclical oriented parts of the market and into not just the defenses but the growth areas as well so if you think about you know sort of the fed commentary we got yesterday they're still anticipating you know they're baking in the soft landing right but they're saying gdp is still going to be sluggish and below that two percent mark for quite some time longer term that is still a good setup for growth so and tech stocks are a big component of that growth trade what are the tech stocks, what are the tech sectors specifically that you like the best right now, Lori? So I'm still intrigued by semiconductors. Um, if you look at earnings revision trends, it's a very good for broader for when you want to get in or out of that space. And we basically had trough-like earnings revisions within semis last year, and they've started to run. Um, we're about kind of halfway through an upward revision cycle. We're not back to peak-like upward earnings revision trends, which is typically a sell signal to get you out of that space. If I look at software, by contrast, you've had earnings revisions that have been quite strong for quite some time. So we're not really seeing, you know, kind of that mid rebound. I think the fundamentals on the software stocks are very intriguing longer term, but you don't have that sort of short term earnings revision recovery dynamic, you know, that makes the semis look pretty interesting. I, I was just talking to Ed Ludlow about this, Lori, and it seems like, at least in pockets, we see, you know, Apple kind of admitting we can't do everything that chip makers can do in-house, at least not as quickly. Um, we saw that today, in a, in a sense, uh, from Google, or actually we saw Google say they're going to do that and maybe back down on it later. Do you think that's the case? I don't know if I can get that granular in, in, you know, into that particular debate, but I do think semis are essentially the, the backbone of the new age economy. And, you know, and to a certain extent, they are commoditized, but in certain sense, you do need a real specialization. So, you know, I would still look at the semis themselves, to be honest. In terms of M&A, you know, we had a big deal this morning um, that, that Ed was talking to us about. M&A, though, has been slow. IPOs had been slow. Is that turning around now that we see more people coming to market and some deals getting done? You know, it's interesting. Um, you know, I used to cover the small cap space and you, know, you kind of think about IPO markets and small cap performance going hand in hand. And I was listening to, you know, sort of your show earlier today where you're talking about sort of these pops in the IPO market not really sticking. I could have very easily written that about the small cap space and the attempts to sort of bottom and start to outperform large caps over the last few months. I mean, the small caps are just sort of a good gauge, you know, for kind of risk on behavior, I think, similar to the IPO market. And we've seen just a series of failed attempts in the small cap space to, to really just kind of break out and rally and longer term economic concerns the idea that the market is not quite done with this maybe we're just delaying the recession instead of avoiding it um, you know has really you know cast some doubt on the small cap space I think the other thing you know for sort of the riskier parts of the market um, is pushing out some of the Fed cuts reducing some of the Fed cuts for next year I've always been telling people small caps are really dependent on getting rate cuts as a potential catalyst coming in here um, so I think you know that was not such good news yesterday yeah. necessarily from sort of a risk perspective. And as a result, we see the Russell 2000 underperforming the other indexes. Lori Calvacina, always great to get time with you. Thank you so much for stopping by. Lori Calvacina there of RBC. Coming up, Q3 earnings cycle starting to ramp up already. The earnings cycle is now turning up. Inflation is now falling enough to take the pressure off, off profit margins. Looking forward to next year, which I think is going to drive this sort of fourth quarter rally. Um, is double, return to double-digit earnings growth. KB Home reporting soft gross margins. That conversation up next. This is Bloomberg. The earnings cycle is now turning up. And it doesn't have really very much to do with the real economy. It's very tech-led. Uh, inflation is now falling enough to take the pressure off, off profit margins. And probably the third and least important one is that the economy is sort of hanging in there. So looking forward to next year, which I think is going to drive this sort of fourth quarter rally, um, is double, return to double-digit earnings growth. And um, the Fed and, frankly, the rest of the world begin to cut interest rates and keeping valuations high. 
That was Ben Laidler, the uh, uh, global market strategist over at eToro. Shares of KB Home are under pressure despite reporting better than expected results. You heard Ben there talking about earnings growth. CEO of KB Home, Jeffrey Metzger, saying, we're well positioned to navigate the potential for shifting housing market conditions and have started to increase our investment in land acquisition to support our commitments to grow our community count. Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle is here with more on KB. Abby? Uh, yeah, absolutely, Matt. If we take a look at KB Homes, we are going to uh, see that um, the shares right now are currently uh, down about 4%. And this, of course, having to do with what you were just talking about. It also has to do, of course, though, Matt, with the quarter. I mean, this stock is really plunging on the soft, the soft gross margins and the orders miss. And there have been so many questions recently, Matt, in terms of mortgage rates, the 30-year fixed mortgage rate going above uh, 30, or uh, excuse me, not 30%, above 7%. <laughs> uh, and that the idea that that could really crimp demand. It seems as though KB Homes is in fact, seeing that Barclays analyst uh, Matthew Boulay is saying that the sequential order trends are in line with normal seasonality, but it's the fourth quarter guide that should be uh, a little bit of a concern. At the same time, it could be as a trough reflecting the orders from the, the weaker first quarter environment. But you take a look at the stock over the last year, Matt, and year to date, really up in a big way. So the fact that it's yeah. coming in just a little bit, uh, you know, is not so surprising given the weakness on the quarter. Yeah, it, well, it, big beats. Uh, we saw for the reporting quarter, right? In the third quarter, I think they had a dollar eighty of EPS. We were looking for a dollar forty three beats on the revenue uh, side as well. Abigail Doolittle on KB Home. RBC's Laura Calvacina weighing in on the outlook for earnings rights. Our EPS forecasts are moving up, which is unusual in years when they started out too high. Normally consensus forecasts are stable after mid year and don't move up this late. And Lori, I noticed something, you know. In Ben Laidler's expectations that I see um, from a lot of people who are very optimistic about the economy, but also expect rate cuts. Can you really be both? Do we get, you know, uh, a strong earnings growth and uh, a thriving consumer and then the Fed for some reason cutting rates? Why would that be? I think that's a great question. I think that the Fed ultimately, and you know, we heard a little bit about this yesterday, ultimately, you know, does have a dual mandate. And so I think if we do see a little bit of, you know, continued erosion in the labor market and inflation is already coming down and headed in the right direction, starting to get close to where it needs to be, I think they're going to have a very hard time justifying keeping uh, rates as high as they've been. Um, our rate strategists have also talked about adjustment cuts. Um, so, you know, that gets a little bit more technical and behind the scenes. Um, but I think goes to show that ultimately at the end of the day, whether or not they call it an official part of their mandate or not, you know, the Fed is not ultimately, you know, longer term, at least trying to derail the economy, even if they are, you know, sort of willing to risk the recession in the short term. I will tell you, though, you know, I think there are really interesting dynamics next year uh, between earnings and interest rates um, and inflation levels. And, you know, one of the things uh, Laidler was talking about that sort of caught my, my attention was he was talking about as inflation come down that helps, you know, profit margins. And I think that's true to some extent, but I think we all also need to keep in mind that as inflation comes down, it impacts revenue growth in a negative way. That's actually something we've got embedded in our earnings model. So very much, you know, kind of our initial thoughts about next year are that inflation moderating, it's good for multiples. Ultimately, some rate cuts will be good for multiples. But at the same time, there's a negative impact on earnings. So you've really got to monitor the two, the, you know, the two cross currents simultaneously. In terms of, I was thinking about this um, in regards to Japan because they want to um, get on inflation before it gets too far out in front of them. But the problem with deflation is that you put off purchases until later. When you're looking at inflation, right. do you pull those purchases forward? I think you can pull those purchases forward. But I think the, the other situation that companies have really been benefiting from is that when you have inflation, you press, pass higher prices along to your customers, whether those are consumers or other corporations. And we spent much of the last two years hearing companies say, hey, don't worry, we're going to go out and increase prices. And our customers get it because they understand the inflationary and cost environment. And they really can't argue with us. Well, guess what? That cuts both ways. Now that inflation is starting to moderate, we're starting to hear some companies talk about how that pricing environment is just frankly getting a little bit squishier. Some of them are declaring, hey, we can still pass through prices for a while longer. But others are admitting that it's not going to be that easy. And that's where I think the rub on revenues really ends up coming. All right, Lori, awesome to have you on the program. Thanks for joining us. Lori Calvacina there from RBC. Coming up, the market moving events you need to be watching out for. That's next. 
in our trading diary. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg's The Open. I'm Matt Miller in for Jonathan Farrow. Time now for the Trading Diary, what you need to be watching this week. At the top of the hour, we're going to get existing home sales. And then on Friday, we'll get a BOJ rate decision. That could be interesting. The UAW's deadline to extend strikes is also noon Eastern on Friday, plus Fed speak from Mary Daly and Neil Kashkari. And finally, U.S. GDP is due next Thursday. Uh, so that's something that we can watch for on the economy. And coming up next, right now, today, in this very moment, the Bloomberg Global Credit Forum, John, John, Tom, and Lisa are sitting down with Jim Selter, Apollo Asset Management co-president, for an interview you do not want to miss. I'm Matt Miller. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.